And yes, it's great to be back in Christchurch in New Zealand for a bit. We we left just um, uh, a little over a year ago and, and have been in Scotland for a year. And um, why I left is the Island Center for Net Zero. I was recruited to um, set that up and be the research director for it. Um, and so I'm going to also show you how, how that's going. But we're going to do a, uh, um, a, a move through this topic. Um, <laughs> and uh, I guess I gave you this because we're smarter than bacteria. Well, that's all right. <laughs> all right. So did we decide if this thing's working or just... Mm -hmm. <laughs> just yeah. use the arrows okay or, or not okay you guys but... <laughs> well sometimes you have to do it down here first and then it'll go i'm an i'm an, an oldie here at the e6 <laughs> all right uh because we're smarter than bacteria all right well what we know about bacteria is that they're future blind they they really can't see what's coming but that's okay, because their role in the ecosystem is to consume dead things as fast as possible. And it's a good thing they do that. So when they find a source of food, um, because they're everywhere, they consume and divide, consume, reproduce, consume, eat, divide, eat, divide, eat, divide. So their entire existence is growth and consumption, right? As you would be, right? <laughs> if you were bacteria. Now, there's this old um, um, experiment that we can do—a mental experiment. You, you put a bacterium in a in a petri dish full of food uh, at 9 a.m., and we know that the dish is going to be uh, full of bacteria and empty of food by noon. And I'm going to tell you that this bacteria it divides once a minute. So the question is, when is the when is the food half gone? When is the dish half full of bacteria? And this is fun because 20, 22 years ago when I first came to Canterbury, I put that in a in a lecture or something, and we didn't have anybody. We had we had uh, some some students getting out their pans like, well, but we have to know the volume of each bacteria and the volume of the container before we could figure that. Well, I, I did tell you it doubles every minute, and that the the container is full of bacteria and empty of food at at noon. So when is it half full? There we go. One minute before noon, because it's going to divide again. And so the thing I thought was interesting was, well, let's let's get in the jar with the bacteria. Let's get in there and see what it's like for the bacteria. As at nine o'clock, there is more food in there than they could possibly ever think of consuming. Right. And even at 10 minutes before noon, they have consumed one one thousand and twenty seventh of the food but they've only got 10 minutes left. And so even if they knew math and they could work out how many more minutes they had left, which is 10, they wouldn't believe it because you know there's a thousand times more food than they've ever used, right? So are we smarter than bacteria? Would math let us figure out what the future is and then do something about it. Well, not if our entire purpose in this world is growth and consumption. Yeah, if it doesn't include walking in the woods or, or you know, making nice things or yeah, okay. So that um, and if we really um, have a story that doesn't align with changing what we are used to doing. All right, so that's what we're talking about here is transition engineering, which is the way to get off of the story we're telling ourselves about growth and consumption being what is the most important thing and getting on to a different track. So the way we're going to do this, we have a to-do list tonight. We've got uh, three things we're going to do. First, we are going to look up. Um, then we're going to look at how do we change track and then we're going to look at what does it look like when we do that, when we're successful at doing it. So the big do. All right, first, do look up and do what's required. Uh, who's seen this movie? <laughs> okay, I thought it might be out there. Because if you are frustrated with how this is going, with people not listening to science, uh, media being silly, um, uh, politicians being silly, the, the techno wizards, billionaires, not actually solving the problems for us. You know, if that's driving you crazy, this movie will resonate with you because that's what it's about. Now, if you haven't seen it, sorry, I'm going to spoil it. 
the earth gets hit by a meteor and everyone dies. <laughs> so while, while it's a great little thing to show us how silly we are, kind of like my bacteria story, it doesn't tell us what we should do. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't, you keep waiting for it. Well, they're going to figure out what to do, right? No, they're not. Okay, so we're going to, we are going to look up. We're going to go the right direction. And we're going to reset that situation. Now, you all heard that NASA actually sent a probe out to a meteor that they saw coming, and they hit it today. They, they, yeah, they slammed into it, and then they're looking to see what happened. Well, we're going to do that as a, as a thought experiment. So NASA, the European Space Agency, they've, they've seen this meteor. It's big. It's really big. It's one of those, one of those, and it's 20 years away. So it's out there at the edge of the solar system, but they do the calculations and sure enough, it's a direct hit with Earth. Um, what are we gonna do about it? All right, well, if you do some quick calculations and you say, okay, well, <laughs> now that we've seen this one little probe, we gotta put something really big up there now and it's gotta have a lot of punch with it and we gotta launch it now. And it's, it's such a big undertaking that it's gonna require 20% of all the fossil fuels that we use to go into that project and 20% of all the materials and the effort, You know, 20% of our industrial enterprise has to go into this project of getting this thing um, launched this year. Would we do it? Because you can do the math. If we launch it now, it's coming at us. It'll, in 20 years, it impacts, which means that we meet it at year 10. Whatever we launch now, if it's traveling about the same speed as the, as the, um, as the object, then it'll impact in 10 years. All right, so would we do that? Would we? Would we <laughs> it seems like a no-brainer, right? Okay, but but then if you think about it, we don't really know that much about impacting meteorites and maybe breaking them up, knocking them off course. So we'd have to actually commit to doing it again the next year. So that, you know, the first one, if it works, that's great. But if it doesn't, we've got another one out there and we can learn from the first one and, and take it, you know, do it again. And then, I think we probably ought to launch another one the next year and the next year and the next year. So for the next 10 years, 20% of our industrial output has to, has to go to this, not to whatever fun stuff we were doing with that before. So not our food production, but, but you know, the inputs. Would we do it? Well, here's what it looks like. So 20 years away, we launch um, and then we keep launching one every year. And that gives us a pretty good chance of saving the planet. And it, it, it looks like, okay, because we can learn and we're going to put vehicles up that are agile and they can, you know, try new things, maybe try to break the thing up, that we can give ourselves a decent chance. If we can cut back, if we can figure out how to cut back our consumption. <laughs> I think it's doable. It's a doable investment now just to change the future. Yeah. But that first one, it has to be done now because the closer it gets to us, the shorter time we have to do anything, all right? So, so I would like to see this movie done <laughs> because I think it would be very interesting to see what does it look like to go through the work of changing our um, economy to dedicate 20% of our industrial output to creating a future that's livable. That would be interesting. Um, but we would probably kid ourselves into thinking we're already doing it. That's a danger right now, is that there's a lot of good intention out there. There's a lot of people wanting to you know, have sustainability. But let's check the number of years that we're talking about here because I've been doing that too. I went into university in 1981 to work on sustainable energy and sustainability. In 1959, the United States government built the Mauna Loa monitoring system to measure the carbon dioxide of the atmosphere because they were very worried about global warming. <laughs> so whatever it is we think we've been doing to save the planet, it's now called business as usual. And this is 
a real experiment of what that's gotten us, what has actually occurred, all right? Um, the Kyoto Protocol, if you remember that, um, the science was pretty clear that if the parts per million carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere went above 350, that would change the climate. And it would change it in ways that would produce catastrophic storms, catastrophic fires, catastrophic droughts, catastrophic floods. All right, so that was known. Um, and in 2010, when it became apparent that, that the, the Kyoto Protocol, we weren't going to get anywhere near the targets that were set for that. Um, you know, that, that's sort of when transition engineering was born, because you can't rely on what, what we think we're going to do because it is not working. All right, so now um, think about what is business as usual at this time. It is scientists warning. They're, they're getting hoarse from doing all the warning. Um, sustainability institutes, centers, organizations, how many of them are there? Um, clearly that's not working. More renewable energy. There's been a lot more renewable energy and the rate of growth of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing. All right, so something's not working out here. ESG, so um, financing, SDGs, COPs, we've got all these things and we're on the 27th COP. It is not working. Climate protests, biggest one ever just before COVID. The kids, um, 7 million worldwide on one day went out to protest for a future. <sighs> Net zero targets. All right, so my little sticky note here is going to come off. And we're going to say that, look, um, as far as engineering goes, we're going to use a new language. Language is very important. And the language we're going to use is load to failure. The science is extremely clear. The irreversible load to failure where the climate essentially will fail, the, the, the glaciers will melt, the sea will rise, the, the property damage will be really impressive. Um, in engineering language, that failure limit is about 440 parts per million for a 60% chance. That's the that's the way we sort of look at things. I would double it if I, you know, I, I would I would back it down. I would say 420 is enough, but we already passed that. So something happens now and it's big. And the Mauna Loa CO2 monitoring does that instead of continuing to grow at two to three percent a year. What is that? Well, the maths says that it is a very steep reduction of fossil fuel production. Because I've given you the numbers here in gigatons of fossil carbon per year being produced. Do you hear that language when we're talking about climate change? That's always emissions, these magic emissions that come from somewhere. I don't know where they come from. Well. They're fossil fuel, that's what they are. Um, yeah, we're, we're really good at doing that and getting it out of the ground and into the air. But that's the thing that now, um, this is directly from the um, IPCC sixth assessment report, but I've rearranged it for you so you can look at it like a prob probability curve. What we've got is if you want a 2% probability of staying below 1.5, then you have to have a 3% per year reduction of fossil fuel production. That one even seems impossible. We were talking about a 20% reduction in our uh, save the planet from an asteroid pro um, experiment. And that's this one. That gives us an 80% chance. All right. So what I did was I did a survey of um, the Mokapuna that I know. And um, she said this one. <laughs> that's the one that would be really good. Do that, Grandma. <laughs> so. Um, what that means then to get an 80% chance is an 80% downshift of fossil fuel. And if you think about it like an engineer, if I've got a system that currently consumes fossil fuel, engineering a incremental change in that system is not going to give me a logical outcome the way resetting, redoing, reworking, redesigning that system for an 80%. Because if I'm going to do a change out, it might as well be a change out, right? So that's the way we are gonna think about it from now on. We are gonna say 80% fossil fuel downshift and we're gonna feel kind of comfortable saying that, try it. 80% fossil fuel downshift. Try it again, because I didn't hear anybody. Okay, lightning. 
Okay, see, we survived it. It's okay. <laughs> All right. This is what that looks like, slowing down and changing course. All right, something has to happen. And now we need to turn to how do we do it? You've got the requirement now. Now, that 80% downshift, let's just think for a minute. Um, your mobile phone, is anybody in here old enough to have experienced the first transportable phone that didn't have a cord? <laughs> Guess what an 80% downshift is? It's a rational thing to do, right? Okay, how is it, anybody remember before laptops? You had to do an 80% downshift of the energy requirement of the what a computer does in order to go from a stationary to a portable. You had to. Otherwise, you'd need a shopping cart full of batteries to go along with you so you could, you could move your computer around. So a constraint of 80% less energy is just an engineering requirement. Now, are we gonna be given that requirement by politicians? Who the F cares? Mm -hmm. We're gonna just do it. Why? Because that's what we do. We do stuff the way it needs to be done, according to the science, all the time. If we had to check with Megan Woods before we decide what the peak temperature on the geothermal power plant should be, we'd be in trouble, right? We just do what works the way it works. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna re-engineer this technical enterprise, this massive machine that we've built that runs really good and it's on tracks and it is going, but unlike bacteria, we can look forward and go, oops. And now we have to, engineer the safe transfer mechanisms, which means we are gonna to have to slow down or we could derail, don't wanna do that. So we're gonna to have to slow down and change direction. That's, that's our job, prevent what's preventable. Um, you may still not believe me that this is possible. So let's go here to transition engineering. And I'm gonna give you the proof that we will do this. And that proof comes from the lessons of history. So if you've read my book, you'll know that this was a massive aha moment to simply understand that engineering has changed the future many times in the past. And it's not a story that the world knows very much. I, I don't know that there's any Hollywood movies that were made about the Triangle Shortwaist Factory disaster. Um, there definitely were some made about the Titanic disaster, but you know, um, these, these disasters that came along with the massive up. Um, uplift of the technical enterprise um, were just the way it was, right? So if you go, if we go back to 1911 and we go, let's say, to the United States and we look around, what we'll see is um, daily disasters. Okay, the number of coal miners that died on the job in 1911 in the United States was 39. Do you remember the day that New Zealand lost 39 coal miners? <laughs> this was the daily churn in a time when there was one sixth of the population that there is today. And yeah, the workers weren't really cool with that. They, they thought that wasn't great, but the politicians um, weren't really responding to all the protests. Of the, of the workers, and neither were the industrialists, the mine owners for that matter. In fact, they were putting them down. They were putting down the protests very brutally because what are you trying to do? Are you trying to crash the economy? Are you trying to stop progress? Are you trying to tell people they can't have coal? No, I just kind of want to live through the experience. <laughs> right. So the, the disasters, um, uh, boilers. Okay, there's nothing better than a steam boiler. I mean, yeah, mechanical engineers in the room. <laughs> okay. Uh, but they blew up a lot. They don't blow up so much anymore. Um, factories, they blew up, they burned down whole factories. The death count of, of workers was really high. And of course, you had child labor. So the, the workers were not happy. They were protesting, but there was not anything you could do about it. The whole system was set up that that was just the price progress. It's how it had to be until one day it wasn't. And the thing that made it not okay, the thing that changed the future was 62 mechanical engineers getting together in a room and going, we should do something else. We shouldn't shut down the factories. We shouldn't protest. 
we should look at why so many people are dying and figure out what to do so they don't. Then give yourself the job. And you know what they figured out? The very first thing that those 62 mechanical engineers went home and did in their factories was that there had to be two exits on every place where people were, okay? And those doors have to open out. So if we all have to rush to get out, we can, we don't get stuck in. And that was the, the famous Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire where 140 some young women died in a fire. Um, that when they looked at why did all those people die, um, it, it was that they couldn't get out because the factory owners had locked them all in because they didn't want them sneaking out with a bit of ribbon or something. So no, now it's illegal. If you have people working in a space, they have to be able to get out. And it went from there, safety goggles, um, hard hats, <laughs> just one thing after another, just because you look, what? just look. Um, here's some data to prove the, uh, <laughs> the logic. Um, this is the fatalities in the United Kingdom. So back in 1911, like we were talking about, was actually the peak. That was as high as it got. 5,000 workers died on the job in the UK in 1911. It's kind of lot. And it was the way the economy worked. It was, it was okay. Or, well, okay, not to the people who died. But there wasn't anything you could do about it. All right. Um, but then safety engineering happened. And if, if we extrapolate that for population, we would see that today, if safety engineering didn't happen, we'd have 8,600 deaths as the price of progress. But today there's less than 200 a year and every one of those is not okay. Every one of them is investigated, learned from, and things are changed because of it. Every single one. All right, so that's where we're at is, hopefully you believe me, <laughs> that now a small change in engineering actually can change the future in a profound way. Now we do have to do our big change a lot quicker than this, but that's all right, because we can learn from it. Um, what we learn from seeing a new discipline emerge um, is that the way that we're doing it at the time, take yourself back to 1911, and, and look at this very successful new industry of bringing electricity from power plants to people's um, businesses and homes and factories. Extremely, extremely valuable. And yet they couldn't train linesmen fast enough because they died on the job. Like they would only last a few months. Well, look at them. Do we have any power engineers in the room? <laughs> this is a horror show, right? But they're, they're working, they're doing their best. It was just the way it was. Um, and then it wasn't. And now, um, well, actually, the first thing when those 62 engineers got together, the first thing they wrote down that they were going to agree to do with, um, together was to be honest. What does that tell you about what it was like? That they, they, the hardest thing that they had to agree with each other to do is be honest. That tells me that there were people saying, well, we can't change anything because, you know, it would, it would wreck the economy. We wouldn't be able to do it if you did that. There was there a, you know, it, it, it it would cost too much. Well, none of those things are true. Safety doesn't cost. It returns. And studies have shown that. Six to one. You get a six to one return you spend on safety. It returns six times more. So, right, be honest. Um, and work to prevent what's preventable. So here I'm showing you a linesman today. And you can see the safety gear. None of that is rocket science. It took, it took research, and there were safety engineering research centers set up. There's not a lot of them. We have a fire safety uh, research center here, and it's one of 12 in the world. It doesn't take a lot to make a massive difference. Um, why? Well, you, you do come up with things like the way that you would strap a body so that if it falls, you don't actually smash all the internal organs. You know, that would take some work. You'd have to engineer that. Materials that, you know, that won't snap when you fall. And of course, all the electrical gear and the hard hat. So, so there's an awful lot of engineering in there, but it's purpose engineering. It's not, like I said, it's not rocket science. Maybe there were some new materials involved, but you didn't even need new materials. You could do it with what you had. But the most important thing is that we actually do it. And those of you who know about safety engineering, which should be every one of you, 
because it's so transdisciplinary, it's so pervasive that we all participate in it. We all understand it, we all do it. So we know that it's all about processes of prevention. And now it's normal work, but with duty of care. So duty of care is the thing you're gonna have to, to really think about. Duty of care is what you do because. And that's the trick we're gonna use, all right? Because it's the right thing to do. Um, and it means that you have to change successful, profitable, legal systems if they need to be changed. Think of that courage. Think of the courage it takes to do the right thing. Once it becomes just normal work, then, um, you know, it, you'd have to be crazy to not, to not do it, to not participate. Um, and this participation angle is really important because um, it's not something that that is outside of our activity systems. It's, it's embedded in our activity systems. So this idea, you've probably heard it, well, you can't change people's behavior. Of course you can. It's called your job. Huh? So don't, don't be stopped by the things you can't do. Because look at safety engineering, study the history of it, learn from it, because that's what we're going to do. And it isn't the only one. It was the first one. And after safety engineering came natural hazards engineering, emergency management, waste management, marine safety, all of the safety uh, uh Corrective transdisciplines is what I'm calling them. That uh, why are they corrective? Because over here I've put the dates of the massive disasters that led to a few engineers getting together and going, you know what, we should figure out how to have that not happen again. <laughs> All, right. All right. And so in 2010, when it became clear that the um, Kyoto Protocol wasn't gonna work. There weren't any nations that were gonna meet their targets. When the Deepwater Horizon blew up and dumped unimaginable amounts of oil into the ocean. And when we really started having those climate, um, you know, those extremes that we just had never seen before. You know, since 2010, we've had the hottest year on record every year. It, we've really hit some sort of a, well, like what they told us would happen to you. Right. <laughs> so transition engineering happens now, and it is a corrective transdiscipline. It works like these other ones. Um, what is in the what, what do I think is the biggest barrier to this particular transdiscipline taking off the way that the previous ones have? And I think we have something unique here, and I'm going to call it the sustainability diaspora. When I look at a field like transit, like uh, mechanical engineering, um, think of all the, all the courses that are in mechanical engineering. Does each one of them think that they have the lock on mechanical engineering? Yeah. Well, okay. The fluid dynamicists, they're a little, yeah. <laughs> but we know that actually we have expertises that go together. That's what's happening. And so you have a convergence of the components competencies into an effective field. What does sustainability look like? It looks like some sort of divergent scattering of people with the intention to save the planet, but each one thinking they've got the key to it. They've got the answer to it. I'm starting a group. I, yeah. And so when we got together, the, um, a group of people looking at transition engineering, we were really scratching our head because we're pretty sure the last thing the world needed was another organization about climate change. <laughs> but this idea that engineering had to finally come along, engineering had to find the way to do what it's done before. And it needed a name for that, and it needed a place to converge. So that's that's where transition engineering came from. We decided it was worth it because you have to actually have a professional group, a group that signs their names to something and says, we are going to do this. All right. <laughs> so uh, now we get to how transition engineering is going to actually roll out. And Look, we'll just we'll just follow the pattern of all those previous risk management and and safety management um, uh, disciplines. Uh, you know, borrow from the best. That's an engineering rule. So we will just do that, and we will all be able to say change course and downshift eighty percent. And it's not just oil, but it is kind of funny that once once you downshift um, oil, everything else comes with it. 
right? I mean, we talk about that we've got, well, concrete is like the third biggest country. The world's production of concrete produces so much emissions. Where's the concrete going? Steel, uh, the eighth biggest country. Where's the steel going? Uh, there's a lot of things, but um, mostly consumption and growth <laughs> and cars and roads and bridges and yeah. All right. So um, that's what we're going to do. And um, now that we have a, the first book, the first textbook, um, we're off. So the first thing is that the problems are wicked. So when you're going to actually do a transition engineering problem, it's going to be wicked. And what we mean by wicked is that there is no solution. Of course, we're all telling ourselves the story that we that there are solutions. So stop saying the word solution because that solution is when you have a well-defined problem, but but wicked problems aren't like that. Um, you have to figure out what the changes that you're going to make. So it's change projects we're after. And the way you're going to do it is duty of care. So you don't have to wait to convince Megan Woods that we ought to do this. You're just going to do it when you figure out what the right thing to do is. Um, things are wicked because right now they're working great because we're good at what we do, <laughs> but they're not sustainable. Um, and that's usually, uh, okay, each one of these things stops the creative thinking. So the fact that what we're doing already works great, just like those, those guys in 1911, the linesmen, that worked, you know, was profitable, hmm. but it's not sustainable, can't go, keep going that way. But the way that we meet our needs is with that. And so now we're gonna get scared that our needs won't get met and that'll stop us being creative. Um, but the thing that we're using causes problems. There's pollution, injuries, you know, uh, environmental destruction, plastic in the ocean, whatever it is. And a lot of times we just swirl around the problems. We just get, we just keep getting upset about the problems, and people keep putting it in your in your social media feed. Look at this turtle! It died from plastic. Uh, did you have a creative moment? No, no. <laughs> right? So swirling around these problems isn't great either. And then, and then, what are we all going to do? Well, we're all problem solvers, so we're going to jump at there. I want a green solution. And if you're in a room with people, just try it. Everybody will be just throwing out green solutions. Oh, we could do this. We could do this. We could do this. And it'll just keep going on. And if, if you were doing any other kind of engineering, that isn't, what, that isn't the behavior you'd be doing. But this is, this is visceral. And so it... it it puts you into this position. Um, and then even though you want a green solution, the way we're already doing it works great, so it's too hard to change. <laughs> All right, so that's our wicked problem. Um, now, these problems are also complex. And they're complex because, um, you know, there's a lot of things going on. So this is our elephant and the blind man problem. Um, what we're gonna do is remove the blindfolds, and the way to do that is with a methodology. Now, those of you who are mechanical engineers and got to get through thermodynamics, you know that if I plunked down one of those nice little thermal problems that you know is from a book, so you know it's solvable, and you're looking at it, your brain is going to freeze because, like, I don't know. <laughs> but you know there's a methodology that you can step through to solve it. Same thing with free body diagrams. Th same thing with fluid dynamics, right? That it's it, We can do impossible things because we have a methodology. We know where to start. We know how to use fundamentals, and we march through it. And so that's what this methodology is. Um, and I, I'm not going to go into it. You can buy the book. You can take the course. Uh, but what I do know is that it works. And there's... There's a lot of research behind this as to why it works and, and trial and error and experimentation and um, yeah. <laughs> so seven steps, each one of them involving engineering uh, work that needs to be done, but also communication with stakeholder groups and um, gathering of data and information. So, so that's our methodology and why is none of this going to work? <laughs> Because it isn't an elephant we have in the room, it's a mammoth. <laughs> All right, and it has big tusks. All right, if, if there's a industry that's been pulling in $2.8 billion a year for the last 50 years, I think that explains why we haven't done anything about reducing the amount of production from that industry. <laughs> And why our di diaspora of sustainability champions isn't actually having an effect? Because this is too profitable. It's too big. Um, and it, 
it's indeed wicked everywhere we look. All right. Um, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure we can deal with this. And some of my students know we can too. Um, because this mammoth has a tail. It has a it has something we can use. That 2.8 billion in profit comes at a very low profitability. It turns out that going and getting oil, finding it, exploring for it, drooling down under deep water, fracking, you know, all of the work that it takes to get oil out of the ground and then get it to a refinery and then bribe the king of that place. And then, um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, and get it into your uh, your forecourt. The amount of profit per liter of fuel is minuscule. So they're making that 2.8 billion a year, but at a terrible margin. It's a, there's better ways to do this. And uh, when the fuel price goes up, you know the oil price goes up, those profits just just explode. <laughs> Um, so that, that 2.8 billion, that's actually averaged out over the last 50 years. If you look at the last 20 years, it's, it's way more than that per year. All right. So the thing that we're looking at here um, is the Achilles heel of our giant, uh, our giant um, mammoth is that they have no, no social conscience, no, no um, internal governance for duty of care. That is not a thing, even though the industry as a whole has, has a lot of attention to safety. You, you wouldn't find an oil man that, that doesn't know their safety inside and out. But they haven't extended that, of course, to safety of, of the future or, or <laughs> anybody else. So if there is a way that they could actually make $2.9 billion a year, they would have to do it. Am I right? Because that's the entire governance. That that the mammoth. That's that's it. Whatever it is that makes more profit, that's what they have to do. And if I do a little bit of math and I look at if they produced twenty percent less fuel, they would be making a lot more profit. Yeah. Well, all of that input to get oil out, they just got to reduce that by 20%. Right? So all the expenses. And they don't have to go looking for it in deeper water anymore. And they don't even have to do so much bribing and corruption anymore. So, so they can back down on that and produce 20% less. And do you want to guess what price we would all pay for it? All right. So we're going to have this uh, just really huge improvement of their profit margin. Hmm? Now, if you, if you decrease the fuel production, then the input costs go down by that amount, at least if you engineer that reduction nice, you know, smartly. Um, and then because there's 20% less, the price is going to be higher. So it would be um, best for the economy. The global economy would collapse if that just happened overnight without any planning. But if we knew that there was going to be a 20% reduction in fuel produced and that the price was going to be $150 a barrel, then we would do those projects. That 20% reduction project that we talked about to save the future, we'd be doing that. And in New Zealand, you can imagine it, right? you know that next year, there's gonna be 20% less fuel imported into this country. You go, what would you do? Now we start problem solving around a thing that we couldn't even imagine before. So we're gonna, we're gonna take that 80% downshift as a thing, and we're going to help the oil companies figure out how they come out um, of that with a higher profitability. And that's doable. So, so that's where we're going. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like if the orcs decided not to destroy Middle Earth. It's a little bit crazy. But on the other hand, like I said, they've got that one thing that if they make more profit, then they'd have to do it. So why not? We're at that weird place in time where, yeah, that's, we can't change the way that corporate structures work at the moment. They will change as the world changes, but right now that isn't the way to actually activate that mechanism and get the change. We have to go with what we've got in place. Um, so where we're at now is wrapping up that um, 
the Global Association for Transition Engineering is uh, there's there's engineers from all disciplines in it. And what we all have signed and agreed to do is um, those four things. So in case you feel like it, I've brought the governing tenets for the Global Association for Transition Engineering. Um, and you are um, invited to sign if you feel so moved. Just saying, okay, I'm, I'll do that. Right? If, when we give ourselves the project to do, then our brains start working on solving it. That's the magic. So the methodology, the name, the organization, those are all the um, theater around getting ourselves to go there and look at that that problem. So here's the bigger question then, okay, how does this discipline get moved into practice? You know, how, how do these transdisciplines actually get organized? How do they converge of all, from all the different people doing all the different things into a effective and rigorous discipline? Good question. Because you have to have the underpinning discipline developed by um, through, through research, rigorous, um, methodological, and then you have to have business, community, university, industries, the energy sector, government, they have to have a way that they come together. Um, and if nothing else, just do nothing. So, so with government, it, it would be best if they just did nothing. Spending a huge amount of money on, on diver, di, um, diversions like, like hydrogen and stuff, just not useful. <laughs> um, so this is what it looks like, what we're doing in Scotland. Now, I shouldn't say the government does nothing. They did, they did put down the money, and we had to figure out what to do with it. So they, they um, put up um, 30 million pounds for Harriet Watt University to work with business, local government, communities, um, industries, to figure out how to do the transition engineering to get to um, zero carbon by 2030. How did we start after slowing down the bill? Uh, it's step three in the methodology. Yeah, you get a pencil and a calculator and some paper, and you do the numbers. We call it crash testing. What are we doing? Um, <laughs> um, I, yeah, we've been through this before. You know, back in the two thousands, we we did the hydrogen. <laughs> uh, yeah, but but uh, remember that mammoth? That's why we're doing it. Um, they found out it's really effective at keeping the monkey off their back, right? So, you know, we, we tell the truth. We'd be honest about, and that's tough because, uh, you know, I know at Canterbury, there's people who are getting money to do hydrogen research. And, and so it's tough. Like when I, you know, in the 2000s, just decided I'm not doing any more hydrogen research. I'm, I, I now know. And then about a year ago, two years ago, when I decided, okay, and I'm not going to stay shtoom about it either. I'm going to let people know why it won't work. Because <laughs> we can't waste another 10 years on this. <laughs> yeah, and it is hard, but we keep going. And, and now there's, you know, more and more and more people, you know, engineers all the time who are willing to explain to people why that's a red herring, why it won't work, whatever way you want to look at it. And when we're going through the methodology, we, we just work through it. Um, because yeah, a lot of times you have to convince yourself because it's it's a story we're all hearing that we're going to do the hydrogen, and you think, oh well, somebody must have figured out how to do it in some way that I didn't know about. Yeah, <laughs> that's not what's happening. Yep. Um, it's just basic engineering. You. You just get the information and, okay, what we usually do is what we call strategic analysis. So if focus on the thing you're actually trying to do, what is the purpose? Okay, for that thing, what are the options? And go through the options analysis and put hydrogen in there, put other things in there, any, anything you want to look at. Um, and what you'll find is that the hydrogen turns out to be way worse than anything else, like, like, I don't know. In engineering, we say that doesn't make sense, <laughs> right? And 
I don't know why nobody gets that, what that means, but you can, you can try something like one time I tried this, I said, okay, well, we could, we could dig a tunnel, right? Get a tunneler. We could dig a tunnel from one side of the South Island to the other underneath, right? And then we could use the tidal shift to generate hydro. Everybody, oh, that's a great idea. No, 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 no. That was that was a silly thing. I'm trying to I'm trying to show you what a silly thing looks like. So you got to be careful about that. <laughs> Just be careful. Right. Sure. I still haven't found the answer on Right. Um, we just published a transition engineering project on um, fertilizer. And so we used the country of Germany. And here's the other thing we can't engineer the world, right? You, it, it, it's a huge mistake to try and do engineering in generalities. That's not how it works. You have to have the problem definition. You have to know what's the purpose. What is it I'm trying to do? So we picked the country of Germany, um, the inventor of the Fischer trough fertilizer um, process. <laughs> and we, we did the transition engineering. Okay, what, what would you do? And so that, that paper's just been published in a special issue of the journal Sustainability on Transition Engineering, so it's open access. Um, and you can see how we did it, and you can see what you would do. And the green hydrogen, again, if you put the numbers to it, there's a small component of green hydrogen that might make some sense, but it makes no sense to think you're gonna replace natural gas hydrogen with green hydrogen. So you have to totally adjust the system to where your need for the hydrogen is smaller. Yeah. So same thing with the steel plus. I'm hearing from a lot of material science people that the green hydrogen or, or the hydrogen um, steel reduction isn't um, the steel isn't quite as strong. There's, it it does something else with it. So um, you know there's there's a lot of things that you have to actually do all the engineering. You, this jumping at solutions. I told you we were going to do it. Oh, but I want a solution, right? We're gonna we're gonna just want them, and uh, that that's a dangerous way to go. Like I said, we don't do that any other time we do engineering. So let's not do it here. Um, let's you know let's. But maybe we do next year. Oh, stop hitting school. Well, how many more skyscrapers do they need in China? I know, <laughs> but our current demand for steel is, it's got that in it. It's got China's massive upbuild uh, and the Middle East and, and other places where they've just been, been putting up skyscrapers like maniacs. And now they've got very low occupancy. And so how much steel do we actually need? Let's, let's look at these things systemically. Um, because we we sort of get caught up in oh we have to replace or 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 we, another big pitfall is saying oh well we have to stop that altogether. And there are probably a few things we have to stop altogether, but no downshift by eighty percent. That's that's what we do. So a lot of repurposing of buildings. Yep. Okay, so uh, I think it's a massive pitfall to not get started on 80% downshift because it's not 90% or 100% because we haven't even started on the 3%. So let's set ourselves the target that is, is actually in the IPCC report um, and let's do it. And because we're looking, we will then figure out the rest. But if we don't even look, we're sunk. So I think the 80% downshift in every project we've ever looked at, it's doable. So let's do it. Let's get on with it. 
So yeah, this structure that I'm showing you here is um, what we're calling the transition lab. It's what we're doing at Harriet Watt University. Um, the, the biggest thing is actually this um, data exchange piece. Imagine the um, university hospital system. It's, it's everywhere. It's in the United States, it's in Canada, it's in the UK, it's in France, it's in Germany. The university hospital. Can you picture that? Like we have one, it's right down here in Christchurch. <laughs> um, what is going on there? There's university research into things that we don't know about, developing new diagnostic technologies, developing new treatments, developing you know, new uh, prosthetics, all sorts of things that we need. Why is it associated with a university? Because that's what a university does. It holds the resources that all the individuals can't hold themselves, but it lets us focus and bring together our top talent and our extreme talent and our extreme creativity on big gnarly problems that we don't know how to solve. All right. um, we have material science equipment at this university that they don't have down the street. All right. So this data exchange, this, this digital, the ability to model things into the future, do those calculations about hydrogen, go visit the future virtually, we can do that. And that's the next big thing, is to get that resource so that it, a community that's struggling with how are we going to have sustainable fishing and tourism, yeah, well, we have to get the data, we have to do the transition engineering, and we have to explore together with that community and with the fishermen and with the Airbnb people, what rules and regulations that they need in order for, um, for the outcomes that they want to, to happen. And by the way, the 80% reduction of fossil fuel, what does that mean? What does it look like? How would we adjust? What are we gonna do? So that resource is the new resource that comes out of the transition engineering, and it ties to the hard work of getting into the innovation space where you're actually looking at those questions and not just being overwhelmed by them. And then when you get something new, you have to, you have to demo it. You can't just finish your PhD thesis and run off, <laughs> right? It needs to go the next level. We need to build the um, the prototype and test it out and get it up and running. And then it's going to bump right into our regulations. So we're going to have to work with our regulators and our governance structures to make sure that as this thing rolls out, nobody's left behind and everything works right and it's financeable. And it has to intersect with the community and the community has to be giving the data back. And so this is what we call RESET, which is for, it stands for Realizing Energy System and Economic Transition. And so we're setting up this. Um, uh, essentially, pick like I said, picture a university hospital system. They've got lots of different um, experts from lots of different backgrounds working together um, on call as the fossil fuel reduction triage comes in the front door. <laughs> because right? you know your community says, well, okay, net zero, but we don't know, right? We we don't know what to do. Your ferry company comes in and says, uh, uh, you know. Air New Zealand, I saw their latest ad. You don't know what to do, do you? <laughs> Come on in, we can help you. Come on, it'll be all right. Just come on in, all right? <laughs> so that's, that's where we're going, that's what we're doing, and that's what I think will be replicable, that universities around the world will set up the same thing, so we'll get that same resource, and that probably will need to be funded by government to get that, that virtual reality creation. Um, it, it's not simple. It, it's not, you know, it takes top talent um, and to have it be dynamic enough to deal with a lot of different um, questions, right? Because every, every question that comes in, it's like a person coming in and presenting with some symptom. <clears throat> yeah, you, you go through diagnosis, you do tests, you have different experts and you have different labs where, where they do different things. And um, so that, that's the system we're setting up. <laughs> which I think the second one should be at Canterbury. And that will then prove that that, that, that model works to just bring um, 
bring things through. And I know I wouldn't have enough time to give you examples, but Google transition engineering, and we will be putting our transition lab, um, you know, projects and results up as we as we go along. So you can you can follow that as we go along. And these aren't you know not solutions for everyone, but um, yeah. So there's our progress. We started. Um, back in 2010, when I was uh, selected as the prestige lecturer by the IET, and I um, gave a presentation on transition engineering around New Zealand, and then I went to London, and uh, there was a bunch of people there that, as you can see, got together and decided we needed to um, form an institution. And uh, they did a lot of work on the methodology, and then we got published in 2014, and, um, and on we went. All right, so now we're teaching online courses out of Harriet Watt and out of Canterbury and um, Grenoble University has a master's course in transition engineering. So yeah, we're at the start, but it rolls from here. All right, so thank you for coming out tonight.